Um, it's, uh, it's been really exciting over the last several uh, years to see the solar industry finally take off. Um, here in the, the red curve, you see the price of solar cells uh, as a function of time. Uh, it, it, uh, back in the 70s, uh, it, it was about $100 uh, per watt that you can get from a panel uh, at noon under peak uh, sunlight. And uh, that dropped, and, and then there was a stagnation where uh, there was very little interest in renewable energy, and so not a lot of research. And then uh, more recently, uh, the prices have dived, and uh, now it's down at around uh, 50 or, or 60 cents per watt. And um, in a slide or two, I'll, I'll put that number into perspective uh, for, for those of you who don't follow these numbers. Uh, but as, um, well, you can, you can kind of get an idea that things get interesting at about a dollar per watt because when it got there, that's when the market um, really took off. And now uh, about uh, 65,000 uh, megawatts are installed each year, which is about the equivalent of, of 65 large uh, coal-fired uh, power plants. Uh, so we still have a, a, a long way uh, to go, but things are taking off and growing, um, you know, around 30 or 40% uh, per year, which is very large for something that requires manufacturing. And um, I probably don't need to say it this week, but I think we're at a tipping point. People are taking climate change very seriously now all across uh, the board, which is good for the solar industry. Uh, solar cells are primarily uh, deployed in three sectors uh, on homes um, and you know, generating the power right where it's used. Um, on uh, large buildings in the commercial sector, uh, you can reduce the installation costs as you go to these larger installations. Um, and, and then you get the best cost when you uh, go out uh, to the utility scale. And we're, we're seeing a lot of this in California, if you ever fly from Phoenix to San Francisco, uh, keep an eye out the airplane and you'll, you'll see a lot of this stuff out in the desert. And uh, here you can see uh, from Department of Energy some of the, some of the numbers and on the residential scale, um, if, you, uh, if you know the dollars per watt, you can calculate the uh, cost of the uh, electricity over the lifetime of the project to get what we call the levelized cost of electricity. And without a subsidy in the residential scale, right now that's around 20%, uh, but currently we do have a 30% subsidy and that brings it down to 14. Uh, DOE has set a goal that that needs to get to eight. That, that's when um, people would use solar uh, you know, pretty much um, everywhere. But uh, here in California, most uh, people pay more than that. And um, you know, as a homeowner, I get an electricity bill. And around here, we have tiers. And up to a certain amount of electricity, you're in tier one. And then you go to tier two. Uh, tier four around here is 40 cents per uh, kilowatt hour. And if you ever use your air conditioner, you, you get into that. And um, so solar is, is very uh, popular around here. And what I think is going to happen is the electric cars are going to become more and more popular. Um, eventually, companies are not going to allow people to charge up for free. Um, I, I know of no employer that has a gas pump um, in the parking lot and allows people to have a free fill-up um, whenever they want it. So that's not going to continue with electricity. Um, people are going to have absolutely ridiculous electricity bills at home when they have an electric vehicle. And it's going to, anyone who's smart enough to be able to afford a Tesla will be smart enough uh, to switch to solar um, at that point. And uh, so I think it will really take off. Maybe skipping ahead to the utility scale, you see the prices come way down. Um, because it's just easier to do these large installations. The, um, here, the permit can be really expensive and it's not divided out over a whole lot of watts. Uh, here, it can get divided out of, uh, of megawatts of power that are, that are generated. And, um, and, and you see that uh, um, we still have maybe a factor of two or three uh, to go in the, in the cost reduction, so the, the job is not done. 
Uh, at this point, um, and you, you kind of get a one, you, you, the difference between these two is not technology, it's the uh, balance of systems. And um, you're getting a hint that the um, installation is now a really significant part of the cost. It's probably about 75% here and maybe half there. And so there certainly needs to be work in um, more efficiently installing the systems. Uh, it's not what I do, so it's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but what people can do who make panels is they can just raise the efficiency. And then you don't have to install as many panels and uh, you effectively lower the uh, balance of systems. And um, uh, uh, also, I'll, before I say more about that, uh, you know you've arrived somewhat when you're finally covered in uh, consumer reports. And uh, consumer reports um, now recommends that if you live in a white state, um, you should go ahead and buy solar. Uh, you, you will save money if you, if you do that. Um, but in the blue states, either there's not as much sunlight or um, electricity is so cheap there that um, right now you'd still be better off. Um, so this drives some of the need to, to go to higher efficiency. And here you can see the efficiency of some of the uh, best technologies. I'll start with black because that's silicon. And um, that's about 92% of the uh, uh, market. Um, you can see it is one of the more efficient technologies, but there's also hardly been any improvement in efficiency um, for about 18 or 19 years. There's been improvement in manufacturing to bring costs down, but not improvement in uh, efficiency. Gallium arsenide is better but it's about 40 times more expensive, and I uh, personally don't think that's gonna change, but some people disagree with me. Uh, down here are thin film technologies where you just have a, a, a very thin film of semiconductor on something like glass, and it brings the costs down. And traditionally, it's been copper, indium, gallium, selenide, and cadmium, telluride that were the leaders. And then, uh, and they get the other 8% of the market, um, and then out of nowhere, uh, perovskites um, arrived uh, about four or five uh, years ago. Um, I was fortunate to be directing the center that made that discovery, and so I knew about it right at the beginning. And what's awesome about perovskites is we can print them. Um, you could imagine taking uh, an old film factory or an old newspaper factory, tweaking the tools a little bit, and printing solar cells on plastic. And I've been working on that for about 16 years, but our efficiencies were always way down here. And now we have caught up and um, we can print 22% efficient uh, solar cells. Uh, but I, I believe very high efficiency is, uh, is where things need to go. Uh, we've done some calculations, as have other people, and um, we find that when you can raise the efficiency by one point, you improve the value of the module by three cent per watt. So in other words, if we can go from 20% 20, uh, 20 efficiency to 25%, instead of paying 50 cent per watt, you should be willing uh, to go up to 65 cent per watt um, because of all the extra power. Uh, and then you can look in the market and, and there, is a, there are products with a range of efficiencies and you can find out what are the selling prices and of course, the utility companies know what they're doing, and it indeed is exactly three cents um, per watt um, is, the, is the extra value. And we find that in a place like Palo Alto or Menlo Park, it turns out people would, it would make sense to pay like $1.50 per watt. That may seem crazy, but yeah, if you have a Tesla, you want to do anything you can possibly do to avoid paying the 40 cents um, uh, per kilowatt hour price, but your roof is not big enough to meet your electricity needs, so you need to get the most efficient product you can get your hands on, and, uh, and, and it's, it's worth it uh, to, to pay well over a dollar. And that's, that's why I believe there's um, a strong demand for a high efficiency product. Um, let me say a little bit about semiconductors for those in the audience who um, uh, don't know much about them. They're interesting materials where there are a whole bunch of energy levels that can, that can uh, electrons can go into, 
and, and this call, is called the valence band, and it's filled with electrons, then there's a gap where there are no energy states, and above it there's a conduction band with mostly empty levels. When uh, light uh, is illuminated on these materials, you can excite an electron up into the conduction band. The lack of um, the negative charge creates what we call a hole with positive charge. And until that electron falls back down, the energy is uh, stored. And if we can somehow coax the electron to go to one side and the hole to go to another, then uh, we're able to extract that power and, and, and generate electricity. And when we do this, we, um, uh, we want to get the highest current and voltage we can. And to get a high voltage, we want the band gap to be large because if we excite the electron high up into the band, when it'll fall to the bottom of the band and we'll lose all that energy, and the voltage is um, somewhat related to that energy gap, and the larger it is, the higher the voltage we can get. So that may imply that we want a large band gap. The problem with that is uh, we can only absorb photons if they have a greater energy than the gap. So if we pick a large gap, then a lot of the photons in the solar spectrum will go right through the solar cell unabsorbed. So when you look at the trade-off, you find the efficiency um, versus band gap looks like that. And the ideal band gap is 1.4 um, electron volts. And you can only uh, get about 33% uh, percent, uh, efficiency. But that's with one semiconductor. The uh, way to do better is to have two semiconductors and use one of them to harvest the high energy photons. That'll have a higher band gap and that cell can generate a higher voltage than silicon can do. And then you can have um, also a lower gap cell to uh, capture another part of the spectrum. And you can do even better with three or four or five. However, as you add layers, the cost will go up. And um, so I personally think two layers is ideal. And uh, so I think that um, we can go from a practical limit of around 25 to something up in the range of 30 to 35 um, if we do this. And um, this, this definitely works. The world record solar cell has 46% efficiency. It has four solar cells stacked on top of each other. Um, I personally think it is the uh, most um, advanced semiconductor device that's ever been made. Um, it costs well over $40,000 per meter squared uh, compared to about $80 per meter squared for silicon. Um, so there's certainly no way you can cover um, uh, rooftops with this, although they, they are great for powering uh, satellites and space stations. Um, but I think it just demonstrates the concept works, but we cannot be using um, uh, single crystals that are grown very slowly with a technique called molecular beam epitaxy. Instead, we need a, um, an inexpensive material that works well, even when it's defective. And, and that's where the perovskites, I think, come in. And uh, the perovskites have uh, the right band gap. And it turns out for the bottom solar cell in a tandem, silicon, which is already the market leader, has the right uh, band gap. And uh, so we can just put perovskites right on top of uh, silicon. Um, here's what the, 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 the uh, perovskites are. This is the um, uh, crystal uh, structure. And um, the, the compound that generated a lot of excitement is methyl ammonium lead iodide. But uh, it's all tunable. And um, here, if we switch from iodide gradually to bromide, you can see the color changing. That's because the band gap is, is increasing from 1.6 electron volts to 2.3. Over here, all visible photons are absorbed, so it looks black. And over here, the um, uh, red photons are not being absorbed, and that makes it look um, red. Um, 1.8 EV is perfect for the tandem, and so you see that right in there is the right compound for that. And you can also replace methyl ammonium with something called formamidinium, and, uh, and, and, and that will uh, uh, drop the band gap. 
Only have 20 minutes, so I'll just skip right to it. Um, we got our certified world record uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, when you think you have a world record, you send it to the National Renewable Energy Lab and they test it and um, they, they confirmed. And um, we uh, were at 23.6% um, efficiency now. And um, we, uh, we needed to do one more thing to beat Silicon's record. And I got the text on Saturday that that's done. And 25.6 um, should fall um, at some point is, um, in the next few weeks, I think, um, which is going to be really um, exciting. Um, if you join my group, there's uh, two ways to get one of those 26.2 stickers. The easy way is to run a marathon. Uh, the hard way is to make a solar cell with 26.2. Uh, and um, Kevin Bush is definitely pursuing the, 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 the hard way, and he's, he's, he's possessed, and uh, he's hunting it down. And uh, I hope we'll get to 30 uh, in the next couple of years, and I think we will. Um, another breakthrough, and I, I think this is uh, going to be accepted in science this week. Um, we, uh, we figured out how to do a low band gap perovskite. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, sprinkled in a little bit of tin t uh, to replace some of the lead. We dropped the band gap down to 1.2 electron volts. And here's a side structure of the first all perovskite tandem. And uh, we're only at 17 uh, percent now. I can't, I can't even believe I'm saying only 17 percent. It, it took us 15 years. We, we started at 0.1 percent uh, back in 2000, and, and now 17 is, is mundane. Um, but uh, we're, we're at 17, and we have a list of problems that we've identified and we will fix these. Uh, the layer is just not thick enough. It's not absorbing the light. Um, that's an easy one to solve. And um, we don't quite have the right band gap here. You, you have to get the band gaps just right because you need uh, the same current in both solar cells. If, if one puts out less current than the other, it pulls the, the stack down. Um, so we. Um, we see some indicators that are a little too complicated to get into right now that it's a very good material with huge potential. And so we think we're going to clear 25% soon in an all perovskite <laughs> structure, meaning we can print the whole thing on plastic and have it be uh, uh, flexible. Um, a year ago, these devices were very unstable. Um, they were only lasting minutes. We couldn't even ship them to NREL for validation because they were dead by the time they got there. This was troubling me greatly. And then we have had tremendous progress. Uh, we did three things. We replaced the methyl ammonium, which was leaving the film with a combination of cesium and formidinium. And then we, it turned out we were having corrosion with our metal electrodes. We replaced that with uh, a metal oxide. And then uh, we took advantage of being in Silicon Valley, and we just went to a nearby solar cell company, and they showed us how to do a proper package with a rubber edge seal. And um, with those three things, we're now able to pass the industry standard tests. Um, there are, there's a, a building full of, of torture chambers at a company called D2 Solar. Things like um, you put it in an oven at 85 degrees Celsius, 85% humidity, and leave it there for six weeks. And usually, if you pass that, um, your cells will last for 25 years, even in a place like Miami. And uh, we passed it on the, on the first try. Another one, um, we have an oven on top of a freezer with an elevator that keeps taking the solar cells up and down. And so they shrink and expand, shrink and expand. And uh, we made it through the, the, the 200 cycles, which is the, um, the test that you have to pass uh, to, um, you know, to be able to sell a, a product. Um, so we're, we're really excited about that. I, a year ago, I would have said the probability of passing these tests by now was uh, less than 1%, but um, somehow we, we, we managed to do it. 
And so I think the outlook is, is great. 25% um, is uh, inevitable for the tandems. Um, I think 30% is going to be um, achievable. And um, I, I certainly don't want to say we're done on stability. Uh, we, we, we have a ways to go, and we, you know, we haven't done field testing. And, um, but, uh, but, but stability is looking really good. And, and one of the next challenges will be, can we actually print it on huge area? Right now, these are only one square centimeter. Um, so we, we need to show that we can do it at big scale and, and you know, get the uniformity that is needed. But, um, but things are looking great. And uh, if you want to learn more about solar cells, uh, you have a couple of good options. Um, if you want um, maybe sort of the, the, the small dose, then you could take Bruce Clemens' course, and a third of it is solar cells, a third is fuel cells, and a third is batteries. Or if you want to go all the way, you can take my quarter-long class on solar cells, and um, we also, uh, Fritz Prinz does a whole quarter on fuel cells, and Will Chu does a whole quarter on um, uh, batteries, and then you'll really get into the uh, details. Um, well, I thank you all for uh, listening, and I'll try my best to answer your questions. You know something about solar cells, I can tell. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, UV, yeah, we haven't done that yet. Um, we are um, uh, setting up all the lamps in our lab to, uh, to do some of that kind of testing. And um, so we'll, you know, hopefully find out uh, soon. And um, yeah, we're not, the, the, none of, we really haven't done any of those tests that you mentioned um, at this point. Do you know if anybody in the industry has been looking at those degradation mechanisms for um, cross-cuts yet, or have not gotten there? Um, I would say, I mean, the, the, um, my group and the company Oxford PV are, um, are far away ahead of everyone else on doing this. No, no one else is packaging solar cells and, and doing this sort of thing. Um, and I'm really, really glad that my little team is beating their 25 million pound funded 30 person company. Um, and uh, I know we have higher efficiency and higher stability, so proud of what the students are doing. Um, so if, if we choose to um, just make perovskite panels, not as tandems, um, we, we think we know what they're going to cost. We partnered with Mike Woodhouse at the National Renewable Energy Lab, who runs a team that does cost modeling. And um, he thinks that it's going to be, he's projecting silicon is going to go down to about 40 cent per watt. And he thinks we could get to 34 um, uh, cent per watt, so a little cheaper, not, not massively cheaper, just a little bit. Um, but what's really interesting, the tandem will also be about 34 cent per watt, um, so about the same as the perovskite, but the efficiency would be up at 25 or 26 percent. And, um, and, and that effectively lowers the balance of systems. And so that's, that's where the really big win is, is, is. It's essentially just holding the, the cost in place and raising the um, efficiency. And you know, these are just projections at this time. There is no perovskite factory um, anywhere in the world. Um, you know, silicon right now, you, you, at, at, at 50 cent per watt, you would be getting 16% efficiency. At a dollar per watt now, you could be up at 21 or, or 22. And we, you know, we project all those efficiencies to come up by about two points over time. And, um, and, and you know, we, we expect the uh, costs to, you know, drop from like 50 to 40 cent per watt, something like that. What do we do about the lattice mismatch? Well, when, yeah, when you're alloying them, it just changes the lattice constant and, and it mixes. They're, they're, um, 
and, and when we make um, our tandem solar cells, they're not single crystals. There, there is no, um, it's not like the, the three, five tandems that you might be familiar with where it's important for one crystal to grow off the other. There is, there is no epitaxial growth for us. Um, well, you know, as, as academics, um, uh, I personally, I have my idea of what I think is the most promising path, but um, I'm also um, open-minded that, and I'm and aware that things are unpredictable, and, and here at the university, I like to push multiple paths and parallel course. And one of the reasons you do that is for every student to have their own unique project that they can um, push forward. Um, I mean, the all perovskite, you know, we didn't have that two months ago. That, that, that is really, really new. Um, so originally the plan was to build on top of silicon so that um, we're upgrading an existing product, which is an easier market. and um, entry, but you know, if we make a 25% perovskite-perovskite perovskite tandem, um, things have to be reevaluated. And, and a problem that I didn't touch on, um, it, the solar industry, one, I'll, I'll make an, an aside comment. A lot of people tell me that they like what I'm doing, but a, a lot of people tell me that I'm completely wasting my time because the problems are already solved. And a lot of people tell me that I'm wasting my time because it's obvious that solar will never make it, which I find very interesting. That it's obvious to them on 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 both ends there. And you know, I, I in the time I had, I showed a lot of positive things. But I, what I didn't tell you is that most solar companies are really struggling. They have a lot of debt, and um, First Solar is the only one that has um, positive cash on hand. And that's because the, um, the tools are so expensive. And they're not really in a position to grow right now because the profits, if they have them, are not sufficient to build the next generation of factory. And um, you don't, that gets lost when you just look at that dollar per watt figure. We do, potent, our factories could potentially be a lot cheaper and, uh, and, and, and so that, that, that is why um, some would be very excited by an all perovskite uh, tandem, or even just a single junction perovskite. Well, I see the zero minute sign, so I guess I'm done, and uh, hope to get to know some of you during your time here at Stanford.